So, Britt, let's talk about some stuff that's on our mind. We went to lunch. We talked about a little bit of an agenda. And uh, we figured out why my podcast with my dad had such crappy audio quality because I don't know how to use my mixer here. Yeah. Um, but but let's talk. Let's talk. Okay. So what we're intending to chat about today, uh-huh. I know, is how to create and improve kind of continuity and unity between hygiene and docs. And I feel like this is the same stuff, different day conversation. And there's so many different um, tangents and so many different avenues and directions we can go with this. Um but I think that it is so imperative to any dentist hygiene workspace that we figure this out yeah, on a different I, level. I think what, what I like to describe it is like a lack of alignment between two very important arms of the business of, dental, of the dental practice. And uh, unfortunately, we're not doing very well holistically. There's a lot of infighting and lack of communication and lack of values and understanding and you have the hygiene dentist relationship which is paramount to function at the highest possible level if it doesn't function really optimally everyone suffers right the hygienist the dentist the dental practice and ultimately the patient right and it's like for us it's like oh captain obvious duh but for most dentists it's like and judging by the feedback that you're getting from a hygienist and the feedback that i'm getting from dentists we know this disconnect is really quite large right so, and, and I know, you know, that being said, I'm hearing the disconnect on a very high level of hygiene, in my opinion, because I'm hearing it from mastermind hygienists, right? So those are, we're in the top whatever percentage of like performing in our industry, like a lot of influential providers, a lot of big dental offices, big names, like very successful practices having these same issues. So I yeah, know so that imagine what the every average, level. What the yeah. average or the slightly better than average. No, 100%. So um, the way I look at it, and I have it just a different purview because I don't talk to hygienists very often. Mm-hmm. I imagine you don't talk to dentists as much as you talk to hygienists. But one of the things I do is I spend an inordinate amount of time on social media. I'm not proud of that. Uh, my screen time probably rivals most of the 12-year-olds in the, in the audience <laughs> or the 12-year-old children of the, the audience members. But um, I do uh, – oh, I'm off the screen. Scoot, I kind of like it over here, though. Okay. So much right. like, People okay. are probably just listening. For those that are not watching – Brittany's coaxing me to get back in the video camera. <laughs> so if you're on video, you'll know exactly why that was, was funny. It's but if you're just going to look like me staring awkwardly into space. That's exactly. Okay. Okay, okay, I'm here. So one of the things I see uh, on social media is that discourse about, um, you know, how disgruntled and upset these dentists are uh, about their hygienists and the fact that that some are even debating whether or not to have hygienists in their practice because Mm -hmm. the dialogue typically goes like, you know, it started really acutely rising up like during the COVID, like right after the pandemic that there was this dialogue of hygienists wanting hazard pay. And then the, the, the chat, the chats blew up of like, you know, these prima donna hygienists and they, all they want is more and more and they don't understand that reimbursements are lowering and that insurance companies are not paying as much and they, they want, you know, 45 and 55 and 60, whatever dollars per hour. And then it turned into like, we don't need hygienists. Mm-hmm. You know, and you have these dentists that are rogue and be like, I don't have a hygienist. I just do it all myself. It's so much easier. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, yeah, you go, you know, screw the hygienist or, you know, who needs cleanings? I'm like, oh my God. Yeah. It's like when you're like a little kid and you're watching mom and dad like really fight. You're like, yeah. guys. And it, it's just really disheartening to yeah. see that. It is. And I feel like that's almost the equivalent of watching a car accident as it's about to happen. Like you're seeing it from this different yeah, perspective. You're watching back. it happen yeah. and you can't like stop it from happening because what that tells me is that, you know, I constantly see how hygienists are undervaluing themselves and they don't understand their numbers. They don't understand what they bring to the table. They yes. don't understand fully what they contribute to dentistry right. and to what the dentists are, you know what I mean? Yeah, and then and it's, it's painful because I'm hearing that the dentists on the, on some level don't see it either. It's like no one is choosing to have the lights on. Right. It's like no one's choosing to well, look at Well, they're all going the... how they feel. Right. So a hygienist will say something like, I feel like I deserve $45 an hour. Mm-hmm. Great. I, I feel the same, but let's, why? Right. What do you produce? What do you mean produce? What, what do you mean? Right. Well, what do you collect in it? I, I have no idea. Someone would be telling like 300 and a thousand, I think. Mm-hmm. I don't really know. Mm-hmm. And then the dentist is not saying to the hygienist, like, so everybody's really right. So the dentist is saying, hey, we are, you know, Joe, Acme Insurance Company is only going to pay us $35 for a cleaning. I'm making numbers up. Mm-hmm. So how can I physically pay this hygienist 38 when Acme's paying us 35? Right. But if they just would open up 
and discuss these things. Like, hey, this is her, you know, there's a lot of people that I, I let me try to get this out and then I'll, and then I'll help me with this because it's going to be a hard concept and I want to just try to make sure I get it. What happens is that the business owner does not, um, so the business owner feels the need to explain everything uh-huh. and doesn't want to be as transparent. And the hygienist or the employees, like you're the business owner, I don't have to worry about that. You just have to pay me. Mm-hmm. And there's no, no one's really communicating. If they would just say, hey, hygiene team, let's say one or two, here's the issue. You know, I, I think you girls are working really hard and I want to see you guys have better economic opportunities. Mm-hmm. But I just want to lay out the landscape of what's actually going on. We have Acme insurance companies. Seven tenths of our, you know, seventy percent are insurance are insurance in network. How do we make this work? Mm-hmm. Like, figure out something that works, not just for you. I want to have more economic opportunity for you, but how about you make it work and also make it work for the business, so that I'm not paying you from a decreasing amount of profit that we can all do better. Right. And then let these kids, to which most agents will be like, yeah, it's not really. I don't. I'm, that's not my job. Right. Yeah, but you're working here. We right. have to. We own this business together. Both feeds us both. Right. And there there are so many layers to this. I feel right. like there are so many layers to this conversation because it's almost chicken or egg. Like the hygienist is like, oh, that's not my job. Okay, it's not your job, but you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot by refusing to look at this part of and the practice. This is common with all employee relationships. Mm-hmm. I feel like I'm working really hard. I feel like I should get this much money. Mm-hmm. And I think that's great. I don't. I think there's nothing wrong with having a strong sense of self-worth. And, and, a, and a, I would rather someone to look me in the eye and be like, I am worth all this money mm-hmm. versus like, I think I can, you know, like devalue themselves. Because the first step with an empowered employee is having self-worth. Right. And that's hard to teach. So I actually like when people come in, like, I'm worth this. But then like, you have to backfill it in with the mechanics of the business. And I think that there's no honest conversations. There's very few honest conversations going on. And in fact, what compounds it, and then I'm going to stop talking because I'm talking a lot, is the dialogue of dentists, and they frequently say this, I just don't think that a hygienist should make, let's call it $50 an hour. Mm -hmm. And we know that there's hygienists in this office that blow that away consistently Mm -hmm. on an average. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter to any of us because we know that the compensation structure we, we, we formulated it won't hurt the business. What would hurt the business is a guaranteed $22 an hour for a hygienist that literally twiddles her thumbs all day. That could be the most expensive hygienist we've ever had. Mm -hmm. A guaranteed $22 an hour versus a $55 an hour, $65 high performer. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. And that's just like, I hope that sinks into everybody like that. So your dollars that are spent could be expensive or cheap. Even if it's more money, it could be cheap because at the end of the day, if they're doing a great job and they're making revenue, why do you care? Right. It's like complaining that your real estate broker is getting too much commissions. No, they're getting that because they brought in that much sales. Right. And yeah. then I'll stop and let you, you unpack you can't where we look, are. So you far. can't look at the black and white numbers of the situation because anyone doing that is one limiting the practice significantly. And two, like none of us went to business school, but you don't have to to understand like this percentage of this amount of collections equals this much for the practice and this much for the employee right. getting paid, right? So, and a percentage is a percentage that doesn't break, right? So, it's funny how human psychology is. If I told you to write, like, if there was incremental profit coming to you brand new money you've never seen before, but you agreed to pay me 40% of it. The first time we made $100, you'd be like, $60? $60? That's awesome. Mm -hmm. 40 for you, 60 for me, amazing. Mm -hmm. But then as time goes on and the commission checks are running in and you all of a sudden are paying me $5,000 and $7,000, it might start to bother you. Why am I giving $7,000 a month away? Yeah. But you have to remember, this was a brand new income stream. Right. And I think this human behavior they percentages bother people and they should never bother. Absolute numbers mean nothing. Percentages in business mean everything. Right. If you're spending $50,000 a month on advertising, that's inconsequential because it could be 1% of your gross or 40% of your gross. It's not the number. Mm-hmm. But unsophisticated business people attach to the number. Same thing with your hourly wage. It does not matter. I don't want a $25 an hour or, or $19 an hour hygienist. That brings in nothing or actually can hurt the practice. Right. Well, I going back to the um, dentists doing their own hygiene conversation, like right. how much are they, and I don't mean this to devalue hygienists. I just mean you went to dental school, you have the student loans, you're floating the practice costs and all the right. business things that go into that. And now you're doing hygiene instead of dentistry. 
Right. Like you're opting to do hygiene instead of dental procedures. Like right. what a so loss. At that, at that level, you're saying your highest and best use is a dentist. And I agree. That's a great point. But even more disturbing and, and greater val- loss to the practice is you don't have this mid-level provider enrolling, building relationships and doing what they do best. Mm-hmm. So if we really want to talk about the truest value of the hygienist, one of the things that would not even make the top three would be the mechanical cleaning of the teeth. Mm -hmm. I really think if you really want to distill down like the top three greatest things that a hygienist can provide to add value to a practice, Mm -hmm. that means financial value and relationship value. Mm -hmm. It's prop. I mean, maybe three is a cleaning of the teeth, but it's not one or two to me. Agreed. A hundred percent. No, I think the value is a hundred is, is in that people come back for us. Right. They come back for the relationship that we have and they remember how we made them feel. They like the way that we clean their teeth, but it's more the relationship and that's how and why they trust us to end up in your chair in the first place for right. their restorative treatment. Right. The you perceived know? value. If you have this rock star hygienist, she will add value. And I actually look at the hygiene relationship more like a personal trainer because you're meeting these people all the time in, in not just in sickness. Mm-hmm. So they see us when they break a tooth. Mm-hmm. They see you when they're healthy. Mm-hmm. Hey, just got married. I'm doing this. How's everything going? Your gums look better. Using the Paraprotect. Good job. Like, oh, uh, you know, these numbers are getting better. Like, it's like a coach. Yeah. You're never really done. Mm-hmm. And like, how am I doing? You're doing much better. And then we need to work on this. So it's a consulting role and it feels good. And you're training people to be even more healthy. Yeah. All we do as dentists, most, and not, I shouldn't say all we do, that's that's a gross overstatement, but we oftentimes help people get unsick. Right. You just help them get optimally well. So that consulting long-term relationship is, the, in my opinion, number one. That's the number one thing. So I would think that even if you had people just doing that, and they skip the cleaning of the teeth, that you have a powerful practice, at the beginning of a powerful practice. Yeah. What would you say is number two? I agree. Um the ability to, I don't know if this is in the same stream. I don't think this is on, on the same stream as relationship. I think the ability to communicate and educate. Yes. And the reason, that's what I was going to say, Tim. Mm-hmm. The, the way I think of it is this. It's the ability to point out what's going on outside of the domain of hygiene in a way that's received far different than if the dentist says it. Unfortunately, people know compensation drives behavior. And invariably, when the dentist comes in and says, hey, you know, I'm concerned about the wear on your teeth. I'm concerned about blah, 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 blah. You need X, Y, Z. They look at you and be like, does he need a new car? Right. Versus when you say, hey, I'm concerned about blah, 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 blah. It actually hits a different, total different sector of their brain. Right. This person's trying to help. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even if you were compensated on um, dentistry, which you're not, and, you know, and I don't, I don't really agree that that's a good model for hygienists, but having them have the confidence to, to discuss the disease process is what unlocks the ability of a hygiene department. Because, you know, there are some dentists that are like, what dental school did you go to? I'm like, right. listen, I'm just talking about where. Mm-hmm. You don't need to be a dentist to see that a 25-year-old girl who has lost two millimeters of enamel because of their wear, that that's, you need to be talking about that. Right. And unfortunately, I think at the worst that dentists can be, they could actually insert themselves into that relationship and be like, hey, Brittany, do me a favor. You didn't go to dental school. Don't have that conversation with the patient. You're not mm-hmm. a dentist. Mm-hmm. Those are our patients, just like basically STFU and clean the teeth. Right. And that is a lot more common than I think you and I understand. Yeah, that's very unfortunate if that is super a lot more freaking common. Yeah, super, because it's, it's everyone just going to this dental, whatever dental practice that is to die, basically. Like right. your career is dying, your patient care is dying, the communication right. is dying, the, the relationships within the practice are breaking down. Anytime the practice- Well, it will die until everybody's dead and then you're the dining dead. So like you go, let's say like person like you entered that ecosystem and persisted, mm-hmm. you know, cause you probably wouldn't, you wouldn't obviously at this point, but let's say the you know, seven year old, mm-hmm. uh, seven years ago, whatever mm-hmm. you go and they're like, this just sucks. That's what hygiene is. Right. Fuck it. You know, this sucks. I'm just, I, I I'm just going to clean the teeth. I'm going to get my dollar, you know, hourly thing. And then I'm going to go paint or do whatever else to find your fulfillment. But then what happens is you have this caustic relationship. That's not really fractured fracturing. It's just fractured and patients are all suffering for it. And yeah. it's, I, I really believe, you know, in my, in, in my mind, this is very common. And maybe it's because of what I'm reading, mm-hmm. but I think that this is a very common and unfortunate thing. And what are, what are you hearing when you talk to hygienists? Like, what are their big things? Usually it is lack of autonomy and okay. trust. 
Um, Which plays into one and two character, you know, right. one and two skill sets. Right. And then sometimes it's lack of support on the back end. So when the dentist is giving a hygienist the autonomy to try something new in the practice or bring on Perio Protect, you know, bring on an HR5, try, try a new product with the patients, a new education type of thing, a new assessment tool. Um, when the dentist is yesing that, but not having support regarding like the rest of the team. So for instance, not following up or, or measuring or saying, hey, good job, I see what you're doing there. Or in the morning huddle, not like having the hygiene back in regards to the direction that they're heading. So basically when the team doesn't understand the direction that hygiene is going, like okay. or, when, or when the dentist isn't on board fully or doesn't communicate that he or she is on board fully. So it's not coming full circle. It seems like there's a separate hygiene value happening. And then there's this dentist part over here. So they okay, have so to be like very merge. specific. So hygienist goes in and does what? And so what does there's, do? let's say pr there's a private conversation between dentist and hygienist. Okay. Hey, doc, and what is that? Yeah. I want to uh, bring on this new product. It's called Perio Protect. This right. is what it does for the patient. This is the uh, the um, profit it'll mean to our company. This is, these are the benefits. This is blah, blah, blah. This is the process, the lab, all this. Okay. I'll explain. You say, yes, go ahead, Brittany. Right. You try and incorporate this in your practice. Right. Let's see how it goes. Okay, great. The rest of the team doesn't know what's going on. I can announce till I'm blue in the face, like educate the team in morning huddle. This is what we're doing. This is the direction we're heading. I think at some point the team and everyone needs to know that the the business owner buys in. Yeah. And believes in what well, the hygiene I mean, is let's, doing. Let's, because there there is a lot of support that does or doesn't happen based on your buy-in and your support, whether right. or not you see that. And you're the practice owner, so you've got to remember I don't right, think Right, but let's let's it. rewind when you brought Para Protect in. Uh -huh. It was not easy. Right. Same thing. So we have good relationship, good alignment. You're like, hey, I really feel strongly about this, Sharisa, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. I was like, get some support from the doctors. Yeah. Because I can't go in then. You know, we're, we're a different situation because it's multi-doctor. Mm -hmm. and, and you couldn't steamroll everybody in. I had to get them. You had to have them weigh in and buy in. Right. And you did a presentation and little by little started to opt. And then, you know, mm -hmm. Cab and other people started to jump in with it as well. So um, I, it is challenging. And I think. The, the first step is the worthiness conversation for the hygienist to say, I'm worthy enough as this mid-level provider, as a person who renders direct to patient care mm -hmm. to un, to initiate these things. So I think it's a self-esteem thing on a hygienist part. And mm -hmm. I congratulate what you and Sharice are doing in BP Hygiene because you're raising the caliber of deserve and demand and what you deserve. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully we're allowing on the Bulletproof Dental side to the dentist to say, hey, trust these people. I mean, hygienists get into hygiene for very noble reasons. Very. I've met very few um, Charlotte and hygiene, like uh, salesy hygienists. You know, most of them are just really ethical, kind of like more like Lucy baseliners, amazing people, just really love to care for people. Mm -hmm. It's a caring profession. Mm -hmm. Get to care for people. So I think that there's a lot of mistrust from the dentist to the hygienist, and it's unfortunate. I don't Which, know where it comes it's from. It's so strange because look, I want to actually talk about this because you just brought up a really important topic. And that is that I think my perspective, you know, from hygiene is that we do get into healthcare as mid-level providers thinking we really want to make a difference in people's lives. Right. We really want to be a part of this relationship. We really want to impact people's lives positively and make, make good things happen. And I think that there's a misunderstanding yes. there because we think the dentists aren't coming from that place sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a misunderstanding. And I think that- Well, it also steps on the toes of like, I think that the spirit of a hygienist saying I want to get involved and I want to, uh, for lack of a better term, like manage my level of care and interact with the patient can be like an affront to an insecure dentist. He or she may feel like, who's this? And they use the word prima donna. I hear prima donna a lot. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what the actual word of prima donna, but it's a person maybe who's demanding and spoiled, I mm -hmm. guess. Mm -hmm. But I guess they're demanding because like, hey, I want the very best thing for the patient. I want a better cavitron or digital x-rays or perfect, whatever the thing is. Mm -hmm. And the dentist is like, we can't afford that crap. Like, why are you you're such a, like, you can't do it with this. And it's not positioned like, hey, to take the very best care of the patient, we could do this. And by the way, it's not going to cost us money mm -hmm. because we're going to be able to charge this. So it's like you have, you have your employees in your practice. They're actually your business partners. Because if you fuck up and do bad things for the practice, they get wage, you know, they lose money. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, they say, I'm so, it's so bad because you mismanaged this thing. I have to leave you. I love you, but I got to go. So that by de facto, they're your business partners. So if you were really business partners in this thing, mm -hmm. then you got to be up on things. You got to be like, hey, what do you need help with? How can we assure we're going to keep growing? 
you know, yeah. like, and, and that level of candor is not happening. I think if the conversation becomes, we both want to take the very best care of patients in order for us to keep our doors open, the numbers have to equal this. And this is what it has to look like on paper. Like, the, but with the constant sentiment being patients at the center, patients at the, th- at the center, we're both in healthcare. Always. This is where we're heading. We have common, you know, integrity. We have common values and ethics and all that stuff. Like as long as I think that that comes first, I think the conversation about numbers and money can happen afterwards. I think people go wrong too in thinking that those two things can't be, are mutually exclusive, you know, thinking yep. that you either make a lot of money or you're ethical. Yeah. That's you know? so that's, unfortunate. It that's is so unfortunate. unfortunate because if you, I think as a step one, cause I know we're talking a lot of theory and like a tangible step would be, if you have a small team, it would be really bene- even if you have a large team, but it would be really beneficial for doctor, hygienist, assistants, in fact, the whole practice to define what is it that what it, what is a healthy mouth, you know what is what is disease and what is healthy. Mm-hmm. So disease is not just the absence of perio and decay. A healthy mouth has to be no perio, no decay, and no inter- age inappropriate wear. And what is what what are you looking at? Because I think a lot of dentists are focused on like patchwork, mm-hmm. like you broke a tooth, get we'll fix the tooth and get out of here. Mm-hmm. But that's kind of like could be you know supervised neglect because mm-hmm. if you're seeing major wear and you got a 30 year old girl and she's got major or a 30 year old man and they got major wear and they're headed for FMR by the time they're, they're my age, it's best to have those conversations. And unbeknownst to the hygienist, they may work in an environment like, oh, that guy's super, you know, super money hungry. Why is he recommending orthodontics? Mm-hmm. You know, the crowding doesn't bother her. She said the crowding doesn't bother her, but the dentist never explained to the hygienist like, hey, those teeth are crowded and they're wearing improperly. Right. And this becomes conservative versus aggressive. Right. And what are we doing? And that's why dentistry is so hard because right. we recommend here SRP and Paraprotect and uh, and maybe orthodontics to fix the crowded teeth and go somewhere else. You're fine. Right. You just need two profies. Right. In 10 years, you'll need an FMR yeah, and you years, can yeah. spend $80,000 right. and have right. gum surgery right. and we'll we'll, we'll yeah. do all this stuff. You, and... ha- you just have a little cancer. Let's wait right. for it to spread. We'll take out your lungs. Right. right? <laughs> right. You know, versus like, it, and, and that's the... I, I want to say product market fit because I'm using like terminology like who's the right avatar consumer for this product. But it's like in business, you have to have a value market fit. Like your values are all these things. And over time, they've adjusted to the, we've adjusted to each other's values. But now we have a very uniform value system. Mm-hmm. So either you fit in here or you don't fit at all. Mm-hmm. It's very binary. Mm-hmm. And for some that are not willing to like, if you've been in an organization long enough where it's like you're not encouraged to think, you may not be able to start thinking now. You know, you may not want to come in here and be like, what do I do? Is this a SRP? Is this a Profi? Like, what do you think? What is in your hands? You know, what do you see? How would the best way do you want to handle it? Because if you have a person that just fell off the wagon, it's different than someone who doesn't care about their dental disease. It's an art of diagnosis is what I'm trying to say. Yes. And I think, okay, so step one, agreeing on what a healthy and yes. versus unhealthy mouth looks like. Yes, thank you for bringing like. me back. Yeah. yeah. Healthy versus unhealthy looks like. So if we can agree on that on some basic level, we can right. kind of build from there. Right. And also what's your timeline of healthy? So isn't it incumbent upon us as dental providers if we see someone that's you know, no urgent disease now, but you could see long-term things mm-hmm. with their occlusion. They should at least know about it. Yep. You don't have to put the full court press on like, Mr. Jones, if you don't do this, you know, orthodontics, you're going to lose your teeth. Like that's mm-hmm. not cool. Mm-hmm. But like you have to let people know what's going to happen long-term. And I think diagnose, diagnostic timeline freaks people out, dental providers out. They're very comfortable telling you you have decay and fix it right away. But when it comes to long-term disease, they're like, don't worry. Because you, you and I see it every day when we go into a room and talk to them about like their occlusion and they have wear and they're young, consistently those p- patients always say like, no one's ever told me this before. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How many times has someone told you that? It's because dental disease doesn't hurt until it's severe. And, yeah. and so the dentist wants to be liked yeah. and wants to be accepted and doesn't right. want to lose patient right. Jones to dental yeah. office down the street for right. giving them quote unquote bad news. And a lot of that right. boils down to presentation and values and the or, ability not knowing, to... or not knowing the tools to fix it. So if your FMR is your tool mm-hmm. and you don't really understand some mild orthodontics and some stuff like that, you can't treat it. Right. And most dentists are super busy. And we talk about this in the mastermind and stuff like that. When you're really, really busy, you don't diagnose as well because you know, hey, Mrs. Jones, you need this work and you can't fit them in for three months. You feel bad, so you don't even say it. Mm-hmm. I'm going to watch. I'm going to watch. Mm-hmm. But then it's time to like get more chairs, get an associate, do something because you can't 
limit your patient's dentistry and exposure to access to care because you can't fit them in. Right. And that business can't equal supervised neglect. Right. Yeah. Which but, is... Yeah, but I've been guilty of that. Like running around clinically, like there's a problem here. I'm like, I just can't, like I can't. Right. There's a breaking point. Right. So it's unfortunate that um, these these factors hit dentistry. Yeah. You know. I think um, I think globally, in regards to pulling back to dentists and hygiene and like the misunderstanding, is there there could just be a lot more transparency. And I and I wish that you know, this is in like a perfect world, waving the magic wand. I wish that there wasn't already this culture in the dental industry of like dentists first hygienists, because at this point, I almost feel like we're at like a a standoff of like, the hygienist doesn't want to say what he or she really wants. Dentist doesn't want to say what he or she really needs, thinks that they'll be misunderstood by the other party, thinks that this person doesn't want to help. They shouldn't have to help. Like there's just a lot of like misunderstanding. And I think that what we've done really well in our organization is like, this is a chicken or egg thing, but you know, going back to agreeing on what a healthy versus unhealthy mouth look like, but also where are we going collectively as a practice, making a game plan as to like, okay, how do our values intersect? Like you and I have slowly over time kind of like, okay, what are your values? What are my values? This is what patient care and patient treatment looks like. How do we make these things merge and continue going on in the right direction over and over and over again? And a lot of that has to do with checks and balances and systems that we've put into place and check back points, you know, like our all day team meetings, we, we go back, we measure, we look, we pivot, you know, but yeah, we all do it kind of collectively, meetings, by the way, used, everyone, everyone, no, but you know, what's funny is I used to, I, I don't know if I've ever told you this, but every time the meetings were about to happen, you know, cause things were tight economically. It took off a big chunk with this building. I was really scared. I was really actually scared. I think you, you know that, but those all day team meetings, I'd actually think of how much they cost. Mm-hmm. So like, like, I think they're like 10 grand, like, uh, you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. if you think about the amount of overhead and staff and stuff like that, not, not just shutting down production, but the actual payment. Right. And it would freak me out, but I'd always power through, you know, I'd always power through. Like, this is important to invest in the team, but look at how many thousands of hours. Holy shit. Mm-hmm. You know, thousands and, of hours. And I, I can't even like begin to contemplate how exponential that's been though and what that's equaled even in an income sense on the other side because the whole team gets it right and from the first phone call everyone is contributing to the success of closing this treatment plan you know what i mean so like what does that equal on the other side you can't measure it that's what's tough about it so proving this we're an overnight success after 20 years that's what happens you do the same thing hard consistent work but it's true and and it's hard at this point to think back but thank god we have the mastermind and other people we have it we have a, we have our fingers in the water of general dentistry so at such a deep level that we really get a sense of that. Because without that, we'd have our own pro- we'd, we'd think about our own problems and we'd be like miserable. Now we get to see it's a really cool face for you and I because we get to see oh shit those are cha- uh, we, we we were there. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's where you're at, mm-hmm. and it's really cool because it in some ways is a reinforcing mechanism for how good we have it. Yep. And because you get to see that because without that, you don't you don't have context and we'd complain about all the stuff we have to complain about. Totally. We do. Yeah. But it's um, I don't know where we're going with all this. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm having a really great time. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. <laughs> but um, I, I do think that the all day team meetings, um, vision, values, like there's just certain things. And now the funny thing is, and I, I don't want to get into too much detail, so I'll tell you a story without too much um detail in it because I don't want to out anybody but we have a new treatment coordinator brand new and she's only been here like six weeks Mm -hmm. and she comes to me like I need to talk to you there's a provider here that I'm concerned about not acting the way we are supposed to you know I joined this practice because of the ethics and the values and I'm concerned about this person Mm -hmm. she's brand new Mm -hmm. but she's right Mm -hmm. so it's so interesting like um, to see that, like when when people can sniff out a provider that's like, oh, you know, it's my production for today. They get that freaks people out here, right? You know, like instantly you're not in the tribe, right? Because we never talk about that. Mm-hmm. You know, like some days you're scheduled for six hundred and you're two thousand. How'd that happen? And sometimes two thousand falls apart. But who cares? We're all confident in what we do. Totally. But it's 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 interesting that it can become tribal, and then it's like. For me personally, I was I was telling you this earlier that I, a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago, I'm like, I need to pull back a little bit because it gives more space for people to grow, mm-hmm. which is interesting. Mm-hmm. And to show up as the person that they truly are. And for a lot of people, that equals more success, more autonomy, more thinking for themselves. And yep. for some people, it's seeing their way out of the practice. Yeah, they're just become you know being themselves and kind of like heading in a different direction. And that yep. it's all good though. Yeah, it is. It's all okay. None of it is bad. It's just like 
you know, we've talked about everyone's on their best behavior around the boss. That's yeah. always true. You know, it's fortunate yeah. and unfortunate. You could see the most pleasant part of everyone, but it's almost like <laughs> yeah. they're always on the first date with you. Yeah. They're always interviewing with you, you know, so that's, that's why it's so good because there's so many eyes. Yes. So like I have 50 sets of eyes. So mm -hmm. I, you can be as nice as you want, mm -hmm. but if you kind of be like, Hey, that person was really mean to me. Like you're my, you're my, like my family. Right. So I know immediately and I know you really well. Mm -hmm. So it's like, they can't fool anybody. Because everybody's a part of it, so yeah. that's what we've built. Like I don't, you would, you'd be able. And I had like four people come up to me with this one provider, by the way. So it wasn't just the new treatment coordinator; it was hygienists and blah 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 blah. Yeah, like it was, was that. Theme. There was so much. There's so much redundancy. Mm -hmm. You can only build that when you have a strong family. Like that's what families do. That's like human nature. We're tribal. We're meant to be part of that. You know, family. That's yeah. what I think we're actually meant to be in an environment like that. And not to go further on this tangent, and I just I'll say one thing, and then I'll well, we can bring it back to something tangible. I do believe, like when I built the place and had the visions and all the vision for what it was going to be, I did think of it like a work family, like really like a work family, and like human beings. You know, team is one thing that's really cool. A group of people organized around a specific task, mm -hmm. but community is even higher. It's a higher level of involvement. Mm -hmm. So we're not a group of people organized around a task. We're a community that's organized around a task, meaning like if when the shit hit the fan, like it did during COVID, we were no longer working as dentistry, but like, hey, who needs this? Who needs what? What, ha mm -hmm. what happened? I got this connection. Mm -hmm. And it was a real testament and a real pivotal point for us. Attorney, it was a major inflection point COVID for all of us. Yeah. It was a, it was holistically, I'm not being cavalier, a lot of people had sickness and death and it was scary. But for the business and for what we created, it turned us into another level. I agree with that because even the decision of, almost the entire team to be on Facebook and do morning huddles right. every day, like speaks volumes had about no, no we one were, was being everybody, paid. Everybody was fired. Right. To, no just was, to be clear, like what were we, what was the Facebook meeting for? We didn't have either a place to work or any income. Yeah. You know, and it just showed that when you strip it all away, this is a community. Because mm -hmm. if it was a team, a group of people organizing the task, once the task is gone, the team disbands. Mm -hmm. Soccer teams don't hang out and have reunions i mean maybe they do i, I don't know i, I think I, they do I, yeah, <laughs> Actually, don't I, bring, I can't do so sports wrong. analogies <laughs> so last night at the doctor's meeting someone dr sheik was like you know listen this is like the yankees and i'm like is that a good thing or a bad thing because <laughs> i don't know if they suck or they're great I, I don't no it's baseball. great they were trying oh, to okay. say like this is like you know the doctors who find themselves in this practice are at the highest level oh i see okay. you know and gotcha. it's intimidating it's hard and it's not for everybody yeah so, but um, I do love when people come in though with the perspective that you were describing earlier of of just like where we are able to see now and when the shits hit the fan so many times when other people come from other practices and they've had similar experiences or that experience on some level then they come here like I'm thinking Dr. Santos yeah who says all the time you know like wow what a amazing workplace yeah you have. what an, a unique culture yeah. I'm so grateful to right. be here because he's seen all the shit right that but but this is also an interesting thing he wants he values these things mm -hmm. so one man's trash is another man's treasure it, and to think that just because he likes it or you like it or i like it there are many people who are like f that like i don't want like what do you mean i have to be nice to the hygienist <laughs> what do you you know like you yeah. know that's a hygienist like like i'm a doctor yeah you know so I, we can't sit here and, you know, pat ourselves on the back. It's just very unique. That to me is just a human disconnect though, because I don't care. But it doesn't matter. They've built something for uh -huh. themselves that, that, that we're not, we're very, human beings are very tricky. Yeah. I mean, there's some people who vehemently hate Starbucks and only go Dunkin' and mm -hmm. they're very different businesses, you know, I mean, Popeye's and Chick-fil-A both sell fried chicken, Right. but the, the, <laughs> the, the Chick-fil-A consumer the the Chick Fil A person who works at Chick Fil A would uh -huh. be different than Popeyes. Uh -huh. When you go in there, it's different. And some people hate Chick Fil A, and so you know what I mean. Yeah. So it's it's we can't just sit here and say. So I I'm agnostic to the idea that if you don't like it anymore, when you used to, when people used to not like it, it used to bother me, mm -hmm. and I I try to sell you on it, which makes it all ten times worse. By the way, mm -hmm. you know yeah. it's like you've dated people. I had girlfriends before my wife, mm -hmm. and it's just like it just didn't work. Yeah. And trying to make it work, trying to fit the round peg yeah. in the square hole. Yeah. So I think it's just cool for Santos. And I was very adamant about Santos specifically because I love him. He's got a great reputation in the community. And and I, I just said, I think this would be really great for you. I just don't know. Mm -hmm. But I said that same thing to Jenny, who will last name will remain anonymous. 
and she just never valued it. But like little things in her profile, like not social, like if you don't really like to work in groups, ugh, this is not going to be great for you because right. there's a lot of people. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think all of what we just talked about is relevant to the doctor hygiene relationship, but I'm curious you're, you're, about... this is just your need to stay consistent yeah, it is it is i'm sorry i have to go but back it doesn't to matter time. people are, this if you, by the sitting. way if you like this <laughs> if you like this drop a comment please like or subscribe just say you've enjoyed the rant it's nice am i still on here by the way or is it just like my nose um just your nose but it okay. looks good on camera though okay it's good, it's good from that angle <laughs> yeah, not, not right reality. Side is a good side. <laughs> no reality too looks good, good from here and from there it's, okay, all, it's go all good ahead. it's all good okay so go no i just want to make sure that everyone is kind of getting what they expected hoped for out of this conversation and i think that this is all relevant to the doc hygiene stuff but tell me what else you're hearing what are the other main themes you hear from docs about hygienists that you think that we could touch on or so elaborate i think on? i think they're low i think docs are lonely number one i think that um unfortunately uh we don't get any business training we don't get any leadership development training mm -hmm. and they feel like they're holding the bag you know that they're the ones responsible for everything and I think that um, I'm, I'm not really saying a pain point. I'm actually saying a solution to enlist the help of the people that you have in your office. You actually have this board of directors, these business partners that are wonderful that will actually, if you can share a little bit, mm -hmm. I think vulnerability goes a long way as a leader. Mm -hmm. Like even if you're having a fracture point with your hygienist and your team and you don't know what step to take, take a step back and just be like, look, let's have a real quick meeting in the morning or a huddle of sense just say even if it's just 20 minutes like hey guys i really care about you guys i want to i want to grow this practice I, I i don't i didn't go to school for business training and i just want i need help mm -hmm. what do i need help with i need help to know that i can just make sure that you do your job and that you care about each patient and sometimes i micromanage because i'm scared and i don't want to micromanage you but i'm just scared and I, you know, the last, you, you forgot to check that patient out. And that got me nervous that you never check patients out. I'm sorry I feel that way, but just this vulnerability. Yeah. And then people can be like, oh, he's not just the, or he or she is not just being a hard ass. They're just actually just scared. Right. Because like all communications, even either a loving response or a cry for, cry for help. And a lot of business owners, they're just crying for help. Right. That's why they micromanage. They don't, they're not trying to do that. I, a lot of the masterminders are like, how do I, I don't know how to tell them this. But what it is is like setting the expectation mm -hmm. and then leaving, backing off. Because every, I think in dentistry, we have this thing where we're over protocolizing everybody. Here's the four steps. And here's how you do the first five minutes of your profi should be this. The next four minutes should be this. Right. Like you'd hate that. Yeah. Oh, you know? totally. I would be done in a second. Yeah, yeah. But but if you could, if we could both agree, like what should happen during the hygiene budget? Mm -hmm. They should have this. They should have this. They should have that these five things and then it's up to you to do it right so it's like the stuff needs to be managed but the people need to be led mm -hmm. at the end of the day we could all as the hygiene team check out the five things that were essential but everybody did it in their own way in their own unique way right well i want to point out something about you know allowing others to see into your challenges as a human as a business owner as you know a boss as a doc um people naturally want to help unless like someone has smushed their ability to think on their own and like really step into that. Right. But if you kind of make your needs known and communicate, like, this is what I'm struggling with. People usually want to help. Like they want to yeah. rise to the occasion. Then when they do and they help you find a solution, they now own that outcome. They take partial ownership over that outcome. And that can lead to a lot of pride and snowballing into more trust of themselves, that higher self-esteem that you were talking about. So if it is in a practice where it's been a lot of fear, micromanagement, a lot of following around, did you put lip balm on the patient, that sort yeah. of conversation constantly, and you've kind of squashed the spirit or squashed that autonomy, that's the way to rebuild it, is to let someone in on the struggle, let them help you and own the outcome. It's a chicken or egg thing in there too, by the way, because yeah. like oftentimes the reason why the dentist is stressed and scared is because they are under financial pressure and you don't want to tell your hygienist like I'm worried about, like it's delicate. Imagine like, hey, I'm really worried about the finances of the practice. Oh, okay, I'll help you. Uh, uh, hey, can I go? Practice, yeah, right? you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. it's not like we can have this great conversation because we have a robust business, not knock on wood. And, yeah, but it wasn't always that way. Yeah. So let's talk about when it wasn't that way. What did it you wasn't do? as good. Okay. It well, wasn't as good. It was hard. It was um, what, what wound up changing, you know, I guess it's just maybe my EQ. I have a high EQ. I can sense things mm -hmm. as an L of one like you. And I could just sense like people were scared and not communicating to me and and it was really fundamentally, if you want to distill it down to the to the single thing, it was the dialogue that I was saying to myself every single day. 
What were That's, you saying? I was saying no one gives a fuck. No one cares. And whatever your your dialogue, whatever your narrative is, like I work too hard, no one cares. You know, whatever that is, that is the lens to which you see the entire world through. Mm -hmm. So it's like your primary question. My primary work question was no one gives a crap. I'm the only one here that cares. And if you feel that way, mm -hmm. no matter how sweet and nice you are, people can feel and read what your emotional state is. Yeah. And so you're you treating say, them like they don't give a fuck. Yes. And they're acting like you don't, they and don't then, give a fuck. And then so when you have the people that do give a fuck mm -hmm. being treated like they don't give a fuck, lip balm, mm -hmm. example, and we can unpack that if you want, but whatever. No. It's really painful because mm -hmm. like, I care and you treat me like I don't. So why the fuck am I caring? Right. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. And I think when we point the finger at the dental industry and say what's wrong, it was wrong here too. So I think that we've just, I mean, coming full circle, we had it here too. But um, I think as a leader, you have to change first. You have to, it's, you know, every time I work with a dentist, it's always that, you know, them, them, they, how do you get these people? And I'm like, you know, this is the three fingers pointing back at you, mm -hmm. no matter what. And when anybody starts to make a decision about what they own, I am really excited. So like when someone's like, yeah, I see that. That's like the beginning of massive breakthrough, just right. to see that you play a part in it. Yeah. You know, you don't have the wrong people. None of our dentists and have the wrong people. Right. They just have the wrong leader, and we got to get better as leaders. We have to go first. The first person you have to lead is lead, you lead yourself. You lead yourself to change the better. And then from there, you can change other people. Yeah. But it's really hard. Fuck. <laughs> it's really hard. It's and really it's hard. It's been a long road, and it's, sure, a, and it's a continuous process and evolution. Like, I don't, ours isn't over. You know, it's it's ever evolving and continuing. And I just think that that has to be a part that's accepted too. all the communication is going to always continue. There's always going to be bumps and bruises and losses and wins and, you know, yeah. pain points and, and whatever breakdown of certain yeah. things. You know, death of something in the practice means there's opportunity for something else to live there or to grow there. Yeah, but that's you know? just that like little bit of bravado that you're talking about for me only came through experience because every single death in the practice, mm -hmm. like the Jessica's and all that stuff, I actually thought that was a toilet flushing in the entire thing, like a snowball. So as a business owner, when you get that bad Yelp review or the mm -hmm. Jessica thing, mm -hmm. you can, you play it out. We as humans do that. Like when you're going through a personal relationship or something, you can play it all out. This is going to happen, then this and this and this and this, mm -hmm. and I'm ultimately going to fuck up and no one's going to love me and I'm going to suck and die alone. Right. <laughs> like that's, that's <laughs> literally the brain, <laughs> Yeah. you know? Yeah, it is. So those who, have, you know, it's this Yelp review and then Sally and then that person with the broken temp and then we see the whole thing. Uh -huh. And if you can't control that, you know, you have to you have to be steadfast in business. Like business ownership is not for everybody. Mm -hmm. Like for me, I had to do it, even if it meant less bit, even if it meant less economic opportunity. But you have to be able to control that. Yeah. And then time and then losing those people and then rebounding, like, oh shit, that didn't destroy me. You know, like your personal stuff. Oh, that didn't, that I'm still alive. I'm still, uh, I'm okay. Right. That's really good for you. Yeah. <laughs> because you, you withstand what you thought was a fatal blow and you wind up re rebounding. Yeah. And then you're like, damn, okay. I am a badass. Yeah. Oh, I didn't die. Oh, I didn't oh, die. I am still here. But I am better. Right. Oh, wow. That actually was good for me. Mm -hmm. That's the cool thing in life. Yeah. For me. Like if you can just have a life of that constantly, mm -hmm. you're a badass. I don't care how well you do. I just love people that. And that's why we, you and I resonate to the people that we do. Mm -hmm. You know, we've talked about the, there's a, there's a theme for you and I that we like certain people that have hit rock bottom, whatever that is mm -hmm. and built themselves back up. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. just, it's, you're real. I love it. There's a realness. Oh yeah. There's like an, an unfakeable realness, yeah. you know, like people who haven't gone yeah. there. Well, they're just like, comfortable in their own skin. Exactly. Like, yeah, I was the guy that was, you know, doing this or that. Yeah. I love that. And that, that's my realness too. Like I was the guy who was making everybody cry. Uh -huh. So it wasn't, I didn't have to get there through like something, you know, extremely damaging and, you know, but it was pretty, pretty freaking bad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's interesting. So I guess in full circle, uh -huh. I know we've just totally jack whacked your uh, agenda. <laughs> <laughs> in full circle, you know, what's wrong in the dental practice is what's wrong here, frankly speaking. Um, so we're sitting here pointing the finger outward. We have to point our finger back at ourselves. How did we get through it, I think is what we're saying here. Mm -hmm. So it happened here as well. Um, I think open communication, a little bit of humbling, a little bit of failure. Um, uh, getting alignment um, about what we really want and what we see, having the wrong people here so that we redefine that doesn't fit. What was it about that provider that 
person that doesn't fit. A lot of the times, like even the early hygienists that you were when you were when you were leadership and you fired a couple people, mm-hmm. it like it was hard for me be- and I just had to pull away because mm-hmm. I was like, they like sushi, right? They got to be good, right? Yeah, I know they like sushi, Doctor yeah. C, but they're <laughs> a freaking disaster. Yeah. I am going to step in here and fix this. Yeah, remember? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was hard. It was very hard. And I, I mean, knew if I would have not allowed it because I could have steamrolled you, it would have just taken the, you know, it would have taken the practice in an entirely different direction. I agree. Yeah, I agree. It's just, it's just different. You know, I'm on the ground level and like, just like, you know what the docs need. I know what the hygienists need and I can see what's happening within the department and how it's killing rapport and how it's yeah. killing morale and mm-hmm. how it was crushing production and other people's ability to speak up in the space that they had to be successful and just the whole culture within the hygiene department was it's going who pro- the wrong who's going to protect yeah. the house mm-hmm. is what it is. It's like, yeah. I'm going to protect the house. Yeah. Yeah. It's wild. It's wild. It's, I guess it's basically, I'm just trying to distill it into some steps. People go to work and they're taught not to think. Mm-hmm. So people that have been working long enough are like, you know, we're very responsible, resourceful in our own world. You go to work and you're like, well, boss man's going to tell me or boss woman's going to tell me. So let me just turn the brain off. Yeah. You know, and so it's an unlearning of the worker to say like, okay, this is your, you're a business partner in this business. If it fucks up and you like it and it's close and you like, you like working there, don't let it burn up. Don't let it burn to the ground. Mm -hmm. So that means you have to speak up and it's hard conversations. And then the doctors need to pivot to say like, no, if you have good people, really make sure you're aligned on the expectation of what you want and then really, really get out of the way. And it's better for people to make errors and screw things up and then, come back and align then scare people so bad that they never do anything again right and if we've all agreed on again what does health look like what does disease look like what are the parameters around this then that that is a safety net to give people autonomy and it's a safety net for the practice it's a safety net for you to say this is where we are trying to go do we all agree yes okay go ahead and get there Really, like it's stepping away and saying, like, here's some space for you to do that. I feel like that uh, and then is the, the magic. values, the values integrated to that. So it's not just the clinical alignment, the values too, because then if you have some core values like honesty or integrity mm-hmm. or ethical ethics or taking the rivers care of the patient, then you don't get in trouble why you did something. Mm-hmm. Because as long as you had a why. Mm-hmm. So I did what I did, even though it was a bad outcome, I did what I did because I believed it was the right thing to do integrity. I thought I was taking the best, very best care of the patient. Right. And like not versus like, I wasn't thinking. Yeah. I just did that. I let them, you know, I, I gave them a $5,000 refund because mm-hmm. I don't know who cares. <laughs> so like if you have key team members that are giving you good whys, they're engaged. Mm-hmm. They actually have, they're thinking while they're at work. Yeah. And they care. Let them mess yeah. up a few times. Yeah. And keep going with the whys. Because once you, have an, yeah, once, you have the, once you have, yeah, once you have that, once you have that engaged team or team, that's when you have 50 pairs of eyes or 10 pairs of eyes because they're engaged. So you come in because you think no one cares. I'm not saying you, but right. to those that you you micromanage because you think no one cares. People stop caring and then you can't get rid of your job because no one cares except for you. So yeah, wish it was that simple. What starts as a survival instinct ends up as self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah, you know, for all of us. But yeah. and the funny thing is, is if you really are creative and look at what we're saying, and then bring it to other everything else, every relationship, mm-hmm. those that enter into interpersonal relationships with the fear of like, you know, I have friends that like every time they go out, their wives are like, "Where are you? What are you doing? Are you cheating?" Like, I'm like, "Bro, do you cheat?" Like, Never in my life. I'm like, and then it drives people. So it's our fears mm-hmm. that color the outcome. And uh, I think that if you can't control your fears, you're gonna have a really bad life, you know. Agreed. You know, you Whether know. you're a dentist or a hygienist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you're always trying to bring it to something else. I won't. I, I won't. To. I won't air this I one for to. you. <laughs> no, we have to air it. I've enjoyed this. We I know to. it is just so funny. You're trying to make it relevant. The only thing that would have made it better is uh, some wine. And stuff. Why do you need, need wine? We have coffee. Oh, I need. It's not need. Okay, I, but I why enjoy, would it be better? I enjoy. You know, what the, you know what the thing is? If you had wine right now, you'd think you were better. But yeah. you were You're like, damn, I'm good. <laughs> it's true. But you're good without it. Yeah, I know. I think that's so You're going to wine tonight. It's our Christmas party, our holiday party tonight. True story. True story. All right. You want to make it one more re, re like one more push to make sure that's really done a dental, the, uh, the dental thing? I hope that um, this hygienist and dentist have spoken to all of your wants and needs and we've lived up to your expectations for this podcast. 
Thank you so much for being here. I've really enjoyed this time with you as always. Likewise. And thanks for making the time. Yes, sir. See us on the Bulletproof Hygiene Podcast, the Bulletproof Dental Podcast. And most importantly, Summit tickets are coming out soon, by the way. Yep. August so 2023. August, August 2023. August 11th and 12th at the Win. You know how badass that is? Las Vegas. Do you know how badass the Win is, though? I don't. Let actually. me tell you. Let me just do a little bit of promotion for you. So the win right now, if you were to book a hotel room and at the win today, six months before or whatever, no, eight months before, I'm sorry, it is seven hundred and fifty dollars a night to stay at the win. And it's actually worth that. It's just it's that fancy and that nice. Mm-hmm. But we've negotiated a room block for through Bulletproof Summit mm-hmm. for two hundred dollars a night. Oh crap. So that's like what the La Quinta costs. Wow. Or the That's like a nice La Quinta. No, that's like that's like no a that's standard a, that's La Quinta. A shitty La Quinta. <laughs> No, everything's expensive now. <laughs> the point I'm trying to make, don't, don't try to steal oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The Wynn, back to the The Wynn yeah. is a badass <laughs> hotel, and you know we have this thing because we want to bring the teams. So it's like if you bring 10 people, you get 10% off. You bring 20, you get 20. You bring 30, you bring th- get 30 off. So we're really incentivizing it so you can bring your entire team because gotcha. we won't fix any of the stuff we're talking about now. If And that's another thing. And just to add like one last point, mm-hmm. dentists and hygienists don't educate together. They socialize together. They go on the booze cruise type CE thing and I'll get drunk, but no one learns anything. So there's no right. event outside of what we created that brings hygienists and dentists together and then actually has some strategy because we're all learning in separate domains. Right. And that's really unfortunate. Mm-hmm. And my hope actually is that more we get more competition because if other people start doing what we're doing, mm-hmm. it'll help dentistry. There you go. We'll have competition, but it would help dentistry. That's what it's all about. Yep. All right, so I'll see you in Vegas. All right, see you then. But I'll see you before. I'll see you yeah. tonight, too. Yeah, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for listening. <laughs> Bye. Have a great week. Take care.